there's all of this complexity. Let's go down below as much of it as we can, put in a perfect sandbox layer, and then make everything on top of it according to a set of principles designed to avoid sort of these explosions of complexity that are endemic to the internet right now. Then you actually could rebuild everything that exists and it'll work better, it'll use less resources, it'll be more consistent, and it'll be a foundation that you can then advance technology for a lot longer. All right, everybody, what's going on? This is the Other Life Podcast. I am Justin Murphy. This episode is one in a whole series all about Urbit. Urbit is a whole new computing and networking paradigm that many of you know I've become very interested in in recent months, really recent years, the past couple of years or so. I think Urbit is just way crazier and way cooler than most people realize. I think a lot of people are sleeping on Urbit and just don't really know about what's going on with it, what it is, and all the cool badass people building Urbit, building things on Urbit, creating on Urbit. And so now the development of the technology is really picking up and moving faster. I decided that when the Urbit annual conference came to town in Austin this past October, that I would sit down with 10 different people all across the network, people who are building the technology, people who are creating on the network, and people just in this culture that still I think a lot of people don't know much about. So I can honestly say this was one of the most interesting experiences I ever had at any kind of conference, to be perfectly honest. I spoke with CEOs, I spoke with engineers, I spoke with e-girls from weird theory Twitter. Like I'm not talking about Instagram chicks, I'm talking about like weird theory girls in you know the other life neck of the woods of of the the twitterverse and the blogosphere i talked with skitzed out writers and post everything podcasters and very possibly i spoke even with an alien uh, i'm only half kidding it was just wild man it was really really wild a really really interesting set of characters you're about to meet over the next 10 episodes and i'm just super pumped to bring this series out into the world so Real quick, before I forget, I do want to let you know if you're interested in Urbit, it's now easier than ever to get onto the network. So I actually have a bunch of Urbit planets, aka Urbit ships, pretty much uh, computers in the cloud, an individual computer in the cloud that can be yours. It also functions as your identity, and it's what you use to log onto the network and to use Urbit. So if you want to, I'll give you one. Uh, I have a bunch, and any listener of the show, I want to get you on Urbit. So um, you can just go to imperceptible.computer. I made a whole site just for this purpose. And yeah, drop your email and uh, I will get you a planet, aka an Urbit ship. All right. Um, depending on whether you're listening to this now or two years from now, uh, there may or may not be some kind of uh, modest fee associated with it. Uh, right now, I'm just giving them out for free. You don't need to have any coding or programming skills or experience whatsoever. It's very straightforward. I will give you your own planet and you'll be on the network playing around talking to people in five minutes, probably. Okay. That's imperceptible.computer. I will put a link in the show notes. That's all from me. Let me get out of the way and on to the show. All right. So, Philip, thanks for joining me today. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, totally. So I'm really excited to talk with you because, you know, if you look through the, the Urbit forums, whenever the conversation exceeds a certain level of complexity or sophistication, it inevitably says somewhere, you're going to have to talk to Philip about that. You're going to have to take that one to Philip. So I'm, you know, very happy to have you here, uh, locked in the room for about an hour or so, and I can uh, drill you with some of my most difficult questions, I guess, related to Urbit engineering, if you're game for that. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> Appreciate it. So I want to start with your essay on how to find frontiers. I, I like some of the heuristics in that essay. I actually mentioned it in my newsletter a few weeks ago. And it basically presents your philosophy on how you see different technological opportunities. And it explains how you think about where you should allocate your effort among all of the different projects of all of the different junctures or margins at which one could apply one's effort and creativity you lay out this framework for how you think about where you want to situate yourself. And it ends with some discussion of Urbit. In a way, it's a kind of analysis of how you came to Urbit and how you decided to commit yourself to Urbit. I'd love for you to unpack this essay and this framework for my audience a little bit. Tell us about how you see Urbit in the, the history of computing, but specifically as a frontier to be working on and how you came to the decision that you wanted to invest yourself in Urbit of all of the possible computing projects or technological innovations going on right now, you decided to go all in on Urbit. Just tell us how you came to that decision using the ideas that you laid out in that essay. Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of people 
it, it's it's very common to want to you know go into the frontier of computing or the frontier of technology in some way, um, but most people operate their life by rules that make it impossible for them to actually get there or or do anything interesting there. Um, and so I tried to lay out in that essay basically, you know, the kinds of things that you're gonna that you should be looking for and the kinds of things that you should that you can have to deal with to uh, to actually do that. Um, and a lot of that is going back uh, and when you know it's sort of an analysis of history that puts an emphasis on the paths that could have been taken or the paths that were taken and then and then died out for whatever reason. Um, because very often, the reasons why they di died out, you know, may not apply now, or there may have been something that you could learn from them that uh, that is super valuable and that didn't, you know, that maybe because it was attached to some other idea, didn't end up in the mainstream. And so that's a way to sort of get new ideas um, and be able to pursue them. Right. It's kind of counterintuitive because you're basically saying, look at projects in the past that appear to many people as having failed, as having been the, the branches not taken. And a lot of people presume a kind of Darwinian model where what lasts and what is worked on the longest must be that which is the fittest. And in some ways, people have this kind of intuition, whether that's even a proper Darwinian logic or not. That's what, how a lot of people think about it. But you're saying, no, you actually want to mine all of the branches not taken and then evaluate those for kind of the, the most promising possibilities that have been ignored. So I really like that. And I think it's interesting. It's, it's very counterintuitive and, and interesting to me. So when you apply that kind of framework, how did you land on Urbit of all of the, you know, different paths that could have been taken in the history of computing? What about Urbit jumped out at you as the aha moment where you're like, oh, this is the path that wasn't taken, which we need to take. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so the I mean the, the the problem with with viewing it as as this perfectly efficient Darwinian market is that um, a lot of things are actually just not efficient, and lots of things fail for incidental reasons. Um, and if it all were efficient, then there would be no frontiers to find, anyways. Um, and so that that gets me to the point where I'm like, okay, I'm willing to entertain um, ideas that that do seem far out there and. Uh, ideas that are based on the on on something other than an incremental improvement than just a, like a, a you know darwinian oh we get you know we redirect slightly here there and gets better and better um which is the way that like the internet is built but urban Ur takes the idea that um to that that basically we're stuck in a local optimum um and we need to go far afield to get you know to to make actually significant progress and um that that is compelling to me because basically because i believe it's true and i came to believe it's true uh honestly while working on urbit when i when i first joined urbit so that that, that essay was written after i rejoined urbit so I, I first joined Orbit back in 2014. Um, and at that point, I was just like, this is cool tech. This is fun. Uh, I was I was in school at the time. And I was I was like, man, this is this is all feels new and exciting. And I love the way that uh, that people wrote about Orbit um, and the, like almost stories that were told about it. And I was like, this is this is exciting. I want to just like play around with this. And I didn't know what it was for. I didn't know why anyone would use it as a product or anything like that. I was just like, I, I want to go work on this. Um, um, and so I, I took an internship with Lon, uh, Lon's company builds Urbit, and, uh, and then ended up dropping out to, you know, to keep working on it. The, uh, and yeah, I can go through the rest of my story, but that, but like at some point then I, I left Urbit a couple of years later, um, be, for, a variety of reasons, but basically because I, I didn't, I had become convinced that we needed a lot more resources and it didn't seem like it could happen on my timeline, which my timeline was, this is, you know, something that I'm playing around with basically because it's cool tech and it's fun, but I don't want to like spend my whole career on this. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, if we don't 
get a bunch of resources now, then then it's just going to keep on going for a while. And so I was like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm out. Mm. Um, and then when I came back a couple of years later, um, my mindset had had totally shifted. I was like, okay, I've seen what technology is like in, you know, in the normal world. I mean, I, I'd seen it before, but I hadn't worked in it professionally. And so during those two years I did. And I was like, okay, this all does feel, you know, I guess, you know, civilized in its way, but it's also like a mess. And I can see now why urban exists and why it needs to exist and why everything that we're doing on the internet, you know, now just from a technical perspective um, is, is, is an evolutionary dead end. Like it, it's, it's slowing down. It's, um, uh, it's getting, you know, it's collapsing under its own weight, basically. Interesting. So you, you kind of had an intuition that everything that's currently being done within the, the dominant paradigm is just kind of hopeless. And you actually just, you, you realized Urbit is actually the practical thing to do in a way. Like at first, at first you were like, this is really cool, but it's not really going to succeed in my lifetime. So I don't want to do this. But then you went elsewhere and you were like, oh no, wait, actually Urbit can work now because it needs to, because everything else is so bad. Is that, am I understanding that correctly or? Basically, yeah. Yeah. Like my, my perspective on technology and the internet is simultaneously very pessimistic and, and very optimistic, right? The very pessimistic part of it is I think that everyone that people, that everything that people are doing now uh, is going to continue to get worse and it's going to run into a dead end um and so and 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 that it can't be saved using any of the processes that currently exist really um you can't incrementally get it towards something that that does have a future um it you know it might be five years it might be 10 years it might be 30 years bef- but this direction is, is is a dead end and so that's a very pessimistic view but i also think it can be saved i i, I think that there that you can um that if you go back and try to, it's, it's not even going back in time so much as going down the stack and saying, okay, there's all of this complexity. Let's go down below as much of it as we can, put in a perfect um, boundary layer, perfect sandbox layer, and then make everything on top of it according to a set of principles designed to avoid sort of these explosions of complexity that are endemic to the internet right now. Um, then you actually could rebuild everything that exists um, and it'll work better. It'll use less resources. It'll just be more consistent. um, And it'll be a foundation that you can then advance technology for, for a lot longer. Okay. Fascinating. And when you first decided to step away from Urbit, because you, in your own words, just felt like you weren't sure if it could do what it needed to do with the amount of resources that it had at the time. Is the way that you put it when you came back presumably you had a change of heart and you, you i'm guessing that you felt in the second return to back to urbit that it could win that it, it maybe it does now have the resources or it could obtain the resources how what changed in your thinking about the evaluation of the the practical prospects for urbit right so so part of it is is, is what i just said that you know i sort of wanted it to succeed more um and, but it, there was also during that time, um, so when I left, so for, for, for my entire first stint, which was about two and a half years, um, there were five of us at the company working on it. And we had a couple of meetups that you, I don't remember how big they were, but like 20 or 30 people. And like that was, you know, the, the, the number of people that were regularly on the network was like, you know, besides us five, maybe another five or 10. Um, and it would cycle through. And, you know, it was... It was fun, but it was a small group, um, you know, in in this little office type thing converted from a bar in in the mission. Um, and I was, you know, living and sleeping in the back the back room. Um, and. And then after I so right before I left, we did our first uh, crowd sale. We sold stars uh, back then for two hundred and five dollars each, I think. Um, and. Um, then I was like, oh, wow, because it, it went really, really well. We, we thought it was going to you know, take a month to sell these out. It took four hours. It was I was like, oh, OK, yeah, there, there are people interested in this, um, but we need, you know, we, we need to raise a lot more money. Um, and uh, leadership, which was Curtis and Galen at the time, um, uh, convinced me that actually this, you know, that wouldn't be the right approach 
if you want to make Urbit succeed in the long term. And then I was like, okay, well then we're just going to keep, we're just going to keep working in this way for forever is what it felt like, uh, you know, being a young kid, first, first job out of college. You were um, hungry. You wanted to move faster. You wanted shit yeah, to happen. Yeah, yeah basically. Um, and, and, uh, and so then, uh, while I was gone after I left, uh, they kept going in the way that, that, that they were for a while. And then in, uh, early 2018 raised a significant amount of money, a lot more than I was even asking for back, uh, back when I left, um, and started hiring people. And so by the time I, I that I rejoined there, were, we had maybe 20 employees. Um, and it was like, okay, first of all, you know, this isn't actually enough resources, like at that point, but but it's like definitely going in the right direction and much better um, than I had even wanted back then. Um, but also, it was sort of validation for me that that basically Galen's leadership works and that they're, you know, which shouldn't be surprising that they're much better at uh, evaluating how to how to do that kind of stuff um, than than I am. And so that, that gave me a lot of confidence that okay. Yeah, that uh, we're gonna go in the right direction, and and my you know my mindset had lengthened. I was like, okay, you know, I'm happy to work on this for as long as it's going in the right direction. And so okay, fascinating. Yeah. So your your perceptions of the problems and the status quo was heightening. You 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 saw that the the problem was perhaps even worse than than you had initially thought, and the gravity of that problem, the inescapability of that problem. It made you kind of go back to Urbit and combined with the 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 accumulation of resources, uh, gathering momentum. And what about now? What's your kind of subjective feel about the momentum and the energy uh, behind Urbit now? Just roughly, I'm curious. Is it is it continually increasing? Is it is it now? How does it rank now compared to the moment you were just describing? Um, it's continually increasing. Yeah. Even even then, I mean, we didn't have. Like we had tried for for years at at that point, uh, since the previous time that I've been working on it, to have a product that you could like use in a web browser instead of a terminal, and we always had something that like kind of worked, but was flaky and slow, and nobody ever actually used that regularly. Um, and so, going from that to you know mid twenty nineteen was the first time that we really had that kind of product, um, and going on chain made Urbit ID real in a you know, in a really meaningful way, instead of being, you know, a text file of who owns what, you can actually own this stuff. And then we just knocked out sort of um, like milestone after milestone. Uh, we we got to full continuity. We haven't, you know, had a breach since last December, and I don't see, I don't anticipate us having a breach, uh, like a, a, a network wide breach, um, ideally ever again. We'll see. Um, that's a that's a goal that we were trying to do for for five years, it, it was always like, okay, we're going to sit down and, and, and try to solve this so that because Urbit can't be real, unless your ship lasts, your data lasts, that, that made your data permanent, that made communities permanent. There are now communities on Urbit, which, um, which is crazy because it always used to be just one chat room. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's, it feels surreal definitely to see momentum picking up in the way that, that it has been, um, you know, most recently, of course, uh, we just launched soft software distribution and I'm seeing third party apps show up and I can just click a link, click get app. And then I have them. And that's like, that's crazy. Interesting. So I guess from where you sit in the system, you have a nice bird's eye view. Like how many apps are you seeing being, being pushed already? Like give us a sense of that. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been distracted this last week. So I haven't been around too much on the network, but I've, uh, I have probably eight or 10 installed. Um, uh, there, there might be more. And by the end of, uh, by the end of this conference, hopefully there will be more, you know, people working on stuff here. Yeah. Are there any particularly cool ones that you can leak a little bit or is it all private or, um, I mean, I, it, it was a lot of fun, uh, with a couple of my coworkers just staying, at, uh, staying with me here, uh, the other day, just playing poker on her a bit. Okay. Um, and, yeah, it was just like nice. this works and it's it's fast and it, you know, like it was really cool to just do that. Nice. All right, I'll look out for the poker app. Yeah. Cool. Cool. You have a tweet where you you have a very interesting phrase. You you say at some point in one of your tweets that the average internet user today is captured by gradient descent, 
And I think that's a kind of intriguing and elegant way to describe it. I wonder if you could unpack that for the audience, um, how, what it means to be captured by gradient descent. I just think that's a nice, a nice way of understanding the, the bad equilibrium of the moment. Could you explain that? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so gradient descent, of course, means if you're on like a, you know, some kind of hill or something, uh, going in whatever direction, uh, that is sort of most downhill, right? It's, it's whatever direction water would fall, um, is how I think about it. Um, and you know, in, in that, in that metaphor, the, you know, you are trying to get down. And so if you're always following whatever direction water will fall, then, um, you'll get lower than you are now until you get to some end point. And if that's the ocean, great, then you know, you get to the end. But if you're in a basin, um, then you won't. Um, and if you're in, you know, if you're in a basin, which can be very high in elevation, you will feel like you got as far down as there is, unless you have you go back up over the over the ridge over the mountain or something, and keep going. And it feels like um, the internet is following that path. Every little company here or there, get, you know, makes something more efficient, makes something faster, makes something smoother. Um, but they're all they, they're all basically choosing one dimension and making that a little better. And that will never get you out of one of these basins. Will never get you out, you know, toward toward the ocean. Will never get you to, uh, you know, a global optimum. Right. Yeah. Okay. Fascinating. I just, I just I like that way of putting it, because basically the problem that Urban is trying to solve is how do you get a large number of people to escape this kind of capture in a local a local maximum or local minimum, however you want to think about it, and move it to a to a totally different equilibrium. And of course, it's easy to understand from just like basic, you know, game theory or coordination problems. It's like the payoff for everyone can be much bigger in that new superior equilibrium. And yet it can be hard uh, to get people there because of the kind of short term incentives, essentially. So what is your mental model for how Urbit wins? You know, how do, how do you get the whole population to cross that chasm to a superior equilibrium, despite all of the kind of short term uh, incentive problems, because right, it is essentially in the interest of startups and investors to just layer on another layer of gunk onto this, like morass that we have, right, because it's cheap, it's quick, it's fast. And and you can, you know, launch successful products that make a profit fast, right. So what, what's your mental model? Or what kind of heuristics do you have for thinking about how Urbit wins in the long run? Yeah, so the, the, there'll be some class of apps that is much easier to build on Urbit um, and deploy than uh, than exists on on the regular internet. Um, the version of that 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 seems most likely to me, just as a developer, in terms of someone who you know would like to write apps, is is just the fact that um, Urbit has sort of a bring your own server quality, um, so that if I'm a developer, if I want to create an app. Um, and have people actually use it on the regular internet, I need to write code. And then I also need to, so on, on both client and server, and then run some servers, um, for as long as the app's going to work and, uh, handle a bunch of stuff like identity, logins, notifications, um, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and then keep it running for as long as I want the app to be running. And so in practice, a lot of, you know, what feels like fairly trivial applications need, you know, at least a part-time person working on them sort of perpetually to, to maintain them. Um, and that kind of turns any, any app idea into a company. By contrast, on Urbit, what you should be able to do um, and what we're just starting to see people, people be able to do is you just write the app publish it, and then you can walk away and nothing like that thing's going to last for as long as anyone has it installed. Um, and, and an example just from recently is, uh, you know, on, on, on Twitter, people have been uh, uh, saying GM to everyone, you know, good morning to everyone, because it's a, you know, it's a wholesome way to greet your mates. Um, and there was an app that the only thing you could do on it, um, you know, it was an iPhone app or, some, or Android or something. Um, the only thing you could do on it is, you know, send a GM to your to your friends. Um, and everyone was like, this is cool. They installed it, you know, there's no way to make money off of that really. Um, but that's fine. Um, and then after like a month, they were like, 
you know what, actually, we don't really want to run the servers. It's kind of expensive. And so they shut it down. And that seems like such a waste to me because it should, like, that's the kind of thing you should build just right in a weekend and then release it and not think about it again. And then everyone can just, it can just exist for forever. Right. Um, and that's not true on the old internet, but that is true on Urbit. Um, and so you take problems that used to be company sized problems and you turn them into like weekend problems. Fascinating. Okay. So you suspect there will be some compelling examples of this and it might just spread like wildfire, wildfire from there, basically. Yeah, basically, because you'll have developers that being like, hey, you know, I have this cool app idea. I could build it on the old internet, but it's such a pain it, and it'll be real quick to, to just build it on Urbit and it'll hook into Urbit's, you know, notification system. I'll be able to update it on everyone's machines easily. I, I don't have to figure out how, like, okay, I'm going to store people's passwords and email addresses. Like, nobody wants to deal with storing uh, PII, personal identifying information. It's such a, like, you didn't have to have, like, privacy policy right. and all, all that stuff that is just it's a mess and if you're a coder who just wants to build something um you just want to write some code and have people run it on their own machines right and any any app you want to build has to be a company but it also has to be all of this legal infrastructure so it's like yeah. this crazy duplication of effort right. there's so much redundancy all these teams of people are spending all these hours doing the same things over and over again whereas basically urbit abstracts away a lot of that effort and labor basically Right, because it, it, it has a much more natural topology. Like the, the even just looking at the uh like the annoying legal stuff, like the reason why it is annoying is is because it it doesn't sort of match very well with the way that, that laws in the physical world have existed for a long time. Because if you have a server hosting people's stuff, even if all, all it is you're hosting contacts to send GM to, that's private information that's you have to be careful about what you're doing with that. And, you know, people need to know you're not going to just now sell those contacts and make money that way. Right. Um, and on Urbit, you have this topology of just, you know, oh, you wrote an app. It's on your machine. Let me download it to my machine and then I can run it. But all of my information is on my machine, all your information is your machine. Um, and so there isn't any privacy concerns about that. Even Even questions like, uh, you know, how do you deal with like illegal content is just like, well, wherever your machine is that exists in a physical realm, you know, in, in a physical nation, and it's subject to the rules there. It's not something that we have any control over. We, we can't enforce anything about it. But we also, you know, are not trying to, uh, we're, we're not trying to, you know, build like a dark net or something. It's right. It's, yeah. Yeah. I talked with the Terrell guys yesterday, uh, Christian and Logan, who are building payment rails on Urbit. And what they were saying was that they envision what they're, one of the things they're building is for merchants on Urbit, there will be like one terms of service, basically, that you sign once, basically, and then and you can do anything kind of within the Urbit network. So it's kind of another example of abstracting away a lot of this like duplication of effort. So it just kind of links to some of the stuff we're talking about now, which is interesting. So I wanted I want to run by you some of the most common kind of technical objections to Urbit, because I think you're perhaps in one of the best positions to deal with some of those definitively. But before we get there, I want to also learn a little bit more about your involvement with the history of Urbit. I know you work closely with Curtis. Uh, I believe you were a co-author on the Urbit white paper, if you want to call it that. Tell us a little bit about you, those early days. What was it like working with Curtis? And um, you know, what was your contribution to, to the white paper? Yeah. Um... I mean, the, the early days were, were always exciting. Um, I, yeah, I learned a ton by working on all this stuff. Um, I learned a lot from Curtis. Um, he's quite a unique person, um, uh, but he's, he's an excellent systems programmer and he has excellent architectural sense. And so I learned a lot of my, uh, my architectural sense from him. Um, and I, of course, came in you know, thinking, okay, here's, here's the way that I like to do things. And he's, uh, uh, he was very much like, well, no, Urbit's going to work the way that I want it to work. And so I was like, well, okay, sure. I'm just, you know, I'm just an employee. I'm, I'm happy to build it the way you want, even if I think it's wrong. And was that a good thing or a bad thing? It was a good thing. Yeah. Um, because he was right about a lot more stuff than I was. <laughs> um, and not everything. Um, and so it was, it was a good experience for me working with him. Um, there, 
when when we ended up growing, uh, you know, like when I came back, for example, um, we had grown to the point where the engineering team was much larger, um, still not huge, but like, you know, if you have 10 people, that's that's very different than working with, you know, two or three engineers. Um, and, uh, you know, that's around the, the time when when Curtis left and we, you know, we you could see that it was that that was also kind of needed to happen because Curtis is not a manager. He's not particularly good at that. Um, and the project had kind of grown beyond the ability of any person to, I mean, he could still understand it. Um, you, you know, there, there's several people who have the whole project sort of in their mind, but in terms of directing development for it, um, that's, uh, that's definitely not one of his strengths. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, it's all worked out. And what, what was your main contribution? What did you say? What was, what was the main thing you were bringing to the table? Don't be shy or modest. Right. Um, so the, the writing of the white paper, like the, the text of it is, is primarily from Curtis. Um, the, uh, you know, the, and the contents, obviously a lot of that's from him as well. The, uh, the, my, my biggest contribution back then was, was, uh, my work on clay, which is the file system. Um, we turned that into something that has a, a first class notion of types. Um, and so that we can do all the normal file system operations and revision control operations on typed data instead of just on text, the way that something like Git does. And so that's gone through a lot of iteration since then, but it's still something that, uh, you know, that I probably own more than anyone else. Um, and we use that for, for our, uh, over the air updates for all of our source control for our apps and, uh, you know, software distribution is, uh, obviously depends a lot on that as well. And what, what was it like writing with Curtis? Uh, he's known for his writing <laughs> for better or for worse. And, uh, he's, he's quite verbose. He's quite, uh, I can imagine him being, uh, an interesting co-author. Uh, any any interesting observations or anecdotes? People might be interested in that. Yeah, I mean, in practice, at for, for for that, it was basically he wrote a draft, I wrote uh, drafts of some sections of it, sent it to him, and then he did whatever he wanted with that, um, and then uh, you know, and then that was the result. Basically, um, he's yeah, I'm not sh like. It it wasn't exactly an even collaboration, um, and that's you know that was sure. sort of right and not you know right and proper for it to be. Would you say was there one thing in particular that you kind of learned from him, or was there a, one primary lesson that you you kind of got from him? Uh, any major takeaways that you know he kind of imparted to you, whether that be as an engineer or a writer or whatever whatever the case might be. Yeah, um, something I like to say is that. Uh, so I also worked closely with with Anton Dudin at that point, um, and I like to say that I that I learned to care about the little things from Anton. He he cared a lot about making sure every little part of of the program was was correct, and he'd write, you know, really kind of creative and concise one liners to solve stuff. Um, and then I learned to care about the big things from Curtis. Basically, um, I you know before joining Urbit, I was heading in the direction of, of doing everything according to gradient descent being like, well, this seems a little better than that other thing. So I'll do that thing. Um, and Curtis's, uh, you know, constant commitment to just being like, no, we're going to do things right. Um, and no matter what that, you know, no matter if that ends up just taking longer or, uh, meaning that we can't build certain products for, you know, until later, because we're just gonna, you know, we're gonna rewrite this component or that component. And, um, maybe it'll be slow, maybe it'll be whatever. Um, but we're going to do it right. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So this idea of correctness at all costs, basically at any cost, you got that from, from Curtis. I noticed that that appeared in the precepts article on, on the Urbit blog. Mm -hmm. you, you say at, at one point in one of the many precepts that you list, one is correctness is more important than performance. And then again, you also say correctness is also more important than optimality. So maybe an interesting question is when it comes to technology and designing technology and engineering, what is correctness really? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a couple of things that have to happen sort of in a row. Uh, one that, that people really miss, especially in, you know, on the internet now is you have to specify what is correct. Um, lots and lots of code is like, you know, there's maybe, some UI mockups at one end and user stories. And it's like, well, if he passes the user story, that's sort of correct. Um, but in Urbit, we tend to 
say, no, actually, we need to specify exactly the behavior, exactly the semantics of this program. Um, and once you have that specification, then correctness is just making sure that you match that specification exactly. You don't have edge cases that don't work. You don't have um, anywhere where you cut corners for performance or for whatever. And, and you don't have any undefined behavior, right? Something that's really, really common is is to say, well, if you do these things, then this will happen. And if you do something else, we're not really sure. It doesn't really matter. You don't do those things. Um, and, you know, you, you try to avoid exposing those to, to the user, but even exposing those to the programmer causes problems. And so for us, correctness is, is to say, okay, well, let, let, let's specify a good abstraction, a good interface, a good whatever it needs to be, and then write something that matches that exactly. Okay, interesting. So it's basically correctness relative to the definition of the problem or the definition of the goal. Right. Okay, fascinating. That, that makes a lot of sense. It, I think it's hard to overstate how different this is than the average kind of Silicon Valley attitude, right? Yeah. Where, you know, certain phrases are famous, like move fast and break things. And there's actually a kind of valorization of of mistakes and and slapdash, has ha haphazard construction in the interest of moving fast, testing, you know, uh, learning through failure. There are all these kind of euphemisms that are more or less kind of um, uh, apologia for uh, inadequacy in, in a way. And so that I think is overwhelmingly the dominant attitude in Silicon Valley. So are there other, is, is Urbit like Ortlan the only, are, are you folks the only people with this kind of like radical commitment to correctness at all costs? Or, or are there other influences? Or are there other companies that kind of um, you look to for inspiration or maybe authors or thinkers or any kind of rep, other representatives of this, of this attitude that you take lessons from or inspiration from? Yeah, there there are a few other people that that I feel like take a similar approach to to writing software. Um, none of them are very big, but um, ones that come to mind is um, Suckless. They they do they, they have a variety of utilities in the Linux world um, that are known for being very small and doing exactly what they say with no bloat and no no issues. Um, uh, another one is is SQLite, which is a hugely popular uh, MySQL database uh, that's in, you know, it's on everyone's phones and, you know, it's often be, uh, included in an app or included in all kinds of stuff. Um, and their their development process is very unique. It, it, it is open source, uh, but there's, I don't know, three or four developers, I think, and they have, uh, they don't take any outside contributions. They have a very methodical way of, of doing things. They wrote, they, they include basically no outside dependencies. They even wrote their own revision control so that everything will work exactly the way they want it to. They have incredibly detailed testing, um, better than, than, you know, almost any software out there. And they're very successful. And, and they're, yeah, they, it's a wildly successful product. So maybe that's kind of an analogy for how Urbit wins in a way. Potentially, yeah. Um, one thing that they don't have, just looking at it like organizationally and, and sort of philosophically, is they don't have any sort of uh, evangelistic flavor to their school of writing software. Mm. Um, they're like, this is how we write stuff, but and like, you know, they, they go on podcasts and talk about it from time to time, but they're really not trying to change how other people are writing software. Okay, um, and. Urbit is is a platform where we need people writing software, you know, writing apps on Urbit, um, and also working on the kernel, working on the runtime, and we need all of them to understand the Urbit way of writing code, uh, this sort of you know methodical, careful way of writing code, and so we have to be able to you know get these ideas to spread, um, and if we want the internet to switch over to this world then it needs to spread to everyone. Right. Um, and that's what, like that, I, as far as I can tell, is unique um, among other projects that, you know, that, that seem to care a lot about uh, engineering excellence. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I see what you're saying for sure. I think Urbit's aesthetics and kind of the, the social vibe around it is, is unique and I think uniquely attractive perhaps uh, to, to, to potentially many other people. Certainly SQ, SQ Lite is not like, it <laughs> doesn't really have like a brand, right? Uh, right. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so I think now would be a good time to talk a little bit about some of the common technical objections because I often talk with a lot of really, really smart engineers, people who are outside thinkers, really interested in novel ideas, so very you know favorably predisposed to to being an urban hacker. Uh, people who even say they like it philosophically and aesthetically and and everything. But there's always a, a few common objections. I'm sure you've heard them many times and they won't surprise you. But I've yet to really hear someone with a really strong command of Urbit technically respond um, compellingly and, and comprehensively to some of these. So I, I want to put you in the hot seat and hear, hear your take on at least there's two that come to mind. I feel like these two are more common objections than any other two. The one is that it's slow. And the second will be about the difficulty of Hoon. So let's start with the slow aspect. A, a few engineers have told me that they really like it. They find it really interesting. But in, in one way or another, it sounds something like this will never be able to carry the weight of the whole internet. It's just too slow for different types of applications. Uh, and I forget the details because I'm not technically sophisticated enough, but I have heard very smart people make um, an extended case that there are hard technical reasons why Urbit will just simply not be able to be made fast enough to carry the weight of a lot of the applications that Urbit proponents uh, dream that it will be able to carry. So if you would, could you start by steel manning that argument? What in your view is like the smartest critique of Urbit on, on the speed front? Um, what What is the the most legitimate and generous way to, to phrase that argument about Urbit's speed challenges? And then let's try to unpack why it's maybe not as big a problem as people fear. Yeah. Um, and don't be shy. We have a very sophisticated audience, so um, don't dumb it down. Just go go full throttle. Yeah. So the strongest version of that argument um, kind of has there's, – there's, there's two sides. But one is, well, Urbit has existed for a long time. If it was going to get fast, it would have already, or at least we would see significant progress in that direction. Um, and then the uh, another side of that would be to say, basically, um, maybe there is some characteristic of Knock as, as, as a combinator language, which uh, is resistant to being fast, at least on today's hardware, um, and maybe just sort of in, inherently. Um, people have have raised different aspects of knock as being potentially like the uh, the reason why that might be the case. One of the biggest ones they like to do is is because it's uh, because it's fully specified. There isn't any sort of room for undefined behavior, which is what some systems use to uh, to speed things up. If you can, if the program can possibly see everything, then you can't take any shortcuts um, as as the runtime, and so you may not be able to get it as fast as uh, as other languages. Okay, great. So that that's the steel man. So why are you not convinced of this? Why why is this not a, a prohibitive constraint on the full you know adoption of of Urbit for a complex society? Right. So, so taking the like historical argument first, basically, you know, yes, the runtime has been around for a long time. Knock has been around for a long time, um, but we've never put really serious work into speeding it up. Um, and the reason for that is, it's just not that necessary for the kinds of use cases that we're aiming for. Okay. Because this isn't something where you know, your your one server needs to serve a hundred thousand people or even a thousand people. Um, it's just each person has their own server doing their own thing. And so, you know, it just doesn't take that much computation to be able to to uh to handle one person's data. Okay. So let's fast forward to a world where there's millions or even billions of users on Urbit. Let's take an example of something like Twitter. Let's say there's a Twitter on the Urbit network. And you have billions of people sending each other messages. In that context, where where does the speed come from? What will make that feasible technically? Because I think that's where a lot of people, engineers, feel like Urbit can never get there. So so 
if if it doesn't need to come from knock where does it come from technically right so so there's there's two answers to that one is that all of the nodes i mean each of us carry in our pocket enough computational resources to really handle all the data that we deal with generally with a couple of exceptions mainly in the area of of ai um, almost everything else that we do like if you think of what is the data involved in your, like your twitter feed there's like some images some text you know the even like the networking data to to send that from whoever tweeted it is actually just not that much mm -hmm. um and so that's where a lot of it comes from but i also think that so it's being done locally you mean in in the long run of urbit it's like being um, locally done on, on your, your hardware on your ship yeah yeah okay. wherever that's hosted okay um or you, you may host it yourself or if you may laptop but yeah and that's different than the status quo where it's all being done on these servers and like data farms right okay exactly so so there's something that the the critical engineers or the skeptics of urbit there, there's something they're kind of missing about where the computation is taking place very often they, they have a background of basically dealing with a lot of data um and in urbit people just don't have that much data because they're, they're, they're thinking about okay well you know i've worked in this database that has a million users a million entries in there and that's that's not even i mean it's, you know if you have a billion now you're talking about more like real data um but for us each each ship doesn't have doesn't nobody talks to a million people right okay i think i get where you're going here you're you're basically saying like if you're twitter running on in the current internet you have to manage a ton of data and complexity yeah. you're like twitter is providing all of that computation and data processing but in a truly peer-to-peer -peer system it's really just like a few packets going to a few other people is that right now but what about like if i'm let's say i'm like the biggest uh influencer on urbit or something like that and I have a billion people subscribe to my group or something like that. Is that not going to uh, create uh, significant stresses? Yeah, uh, that's a good example of of something that is going to yeah that 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 wouldn't work very well in Urbit right now, and that is going to need some more creative engineering. Okay. Um, and there's a variety of solutions to that. If you can't speed up knock, then basically, it. You could probably still do it, but you're going to have to be building some caches, caching layers outside of Urbit um, to make that work. It's possible, but I but I also do think that we can make knock a lot faster. I think we can definitely make knock a lot faster than what it is now. Um, whenever we do look into it, as like man, this this feels like it's slow. We we very often find something where it's like okay, ninety percent of the time we're spending is doing something really stupid. Um, so something we found recently was, uh, in a particular case, Ames. So when we're sending network packets, it was going really slowly. It was taking like 50 milliseconds, five zero milliseconds per packet, which is very slow. Um, and when we looked at it in a debugger, we found out actually it was spending like 98% of its time, um, writing zero to a bunch of different memory cells. Um, and you know, a small tweak, it was like, a, you know, less than a day of work, I think, to, uh, to change it, so it didn't have to do that. And then now it's 50 times faster. Um, and that kind of stuff, we just run into over and over. So I, I think there's a lot of stuff that we can do in, in that direction to make knock faster. The question of whether knock can be sort of as fast as, um, you know, a normal language, uh, you know, what can it be as fast as, as Python, which is still fairly slow, can it be as fast as you know, as something like Lua, which can be which can be quite fast, is I think, I think it's an open question. Um, I I know some very smart people that think that it can't be, um, in in the way that it is built, and I know some very smart people that think that it can be, and are, that are quite convinced that this is possible. Um, and one or two of them are are actively working on trying to do that. Um, it, I I tend to think that it can be. Um, I have, you know, some experience in, in PL implementation, but um, it is not my strongest suit. And so it's hard to, you know, sure. have an independent evaluation. So yeah. basically, A, knock could possibly be made faster. B, you mentioned caching as, as a possible solution. Are there other kind of dark horse possibilities that are um, plausible other than caching? 
just that come to mind. I mean, I appreciate that maybe it's just a problem that has to be solved down the line. And to be fair, I imagine that the current internet architecture, you know, didn't have the speed it has now in the early days. Like a lot of this is intrinsically um, has to be solved over time. That's just kind of how things work in a way. Right. I mean, Federation in general um, can do a reasonably good job, right? If like Federation meaning? Um, meaning, you know, if you have someone who, who needs to be, you know, needs to be tweeting to a million followers, um, you, that, that can be one ship talking to a million ships, or it can be one ship talking to a thousand ships and each of those thousand ships are sending to a thousand more. Got it. And now you're at a million. Okay. So federation maybe holds some, some key to unlocking speed. Potentially. Yeah. Okay. It, it lets you sort of scale horizontally is right. the term for that. Um, and that that'll work for a lot of stuff. Okay. Um, it, it may not work for, yeah. I mean like that's a good sort of example of, 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 of the type of problem we could run into. There's also, you know, it, it could like, so that one is limited primarily by, sort of bandwidth you could also have stuff that's limited primarily by memory or primarily by computation and they all have sort of solutions like that all right so i think we were finishing the discussion on speed and the challenge of speed with urbit sounds like make knock faster a possibly a caching solution might be promising or a federation solution were there any other um ideas that you have on that front that you think about that maybe engineers in the future might want to think about possibly as as paths forward on that or are we kind of bringing that question to a close do you think yeah i mean i think that's that's pretty much it like it's it's uh you know it's, it's a serious question with a lot of with, with a lot of details to work on but like there's a lot of different ways to make knock faster um some you know someone looked really promising yeah we'll see cool perfect i think i think that's uh plenty to go on so that's great and so finally i want to talk to you about the the final technical objection that i hear the most often from engineers again engineers who are who like urbit who are philosophically inclined but they'll often say something like hoon is just too hard to learn but they'll also be almost a kind of offense taken this is something i notice it's maybe we break this objection into two specific objections one is people will say something like how dare they design something like that i'm it, it's like a it's like an affront to me people people almost feel like Curtis or you or the team that put it together was like trolling them. They almost feel like this is way more complicated than it even needs to be. And people almost feel like it's an art project or it's just like someone got a little too clever, uh, over-engineered it. And it's like an insult. People experience it as an insult. Um, the idea that they would be asked to learn this complicated programming language. So why don't we tackle that one first? Is there a mistake in that perception or can you, can you steel man that? perception which i think is widespread and then maybe we'll talk a little bit about why it's not as bad as people think yeah yeah so i mean the 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 steel man is that basically we can see that that hoon is relatively hard to learn because a lot of people even people who have a lot of programming experience uh tend to have difficulty with it, it takes longer maybe than they expected um, or they bounce off it altogether. Um, and you know, the impact of that, of course, is if this is supposed to be the new internet, then you're number one, not going to succeed if you can't attract developers because it's too hard. And number two, even if you do succeed, you've sort of made the world worse by making people have to work, you know, with worse programming languages or at least harder to learn programming languages. Um, which I'm I'm sympathetic to that argument. It's not a like prima facie, you know, invalid argument. Mm -hmm. um, but my response would be basically that there is actually a lot of value in the way that Hoon does things. It makes some very significantly different choices, but the result is something that that has a very different feel when you're programming it. You feel like you're programming something very precise. You feel like um, we, we call it like solid state programming. You, you, you feel like everything you're doing is precisely defined because you have the whole stack from, you know, from knock to hoon is not very much um, in your mind. And so you know precisely what you're asking it to do. And when you have data, it's a noun. It's, you know, it's either a cell, you know, so a pair of nouns or uh, a number, just a natural number. Um, 
And the fact that everything's in this very sort of tangible form and the way that that's, the runes are laid out, the way that all this stuff works, you can see the structure of the code just based on these runes without having to sort of engage your, um, you know, your recollection of what this word means in this context without like your linguistic mind, basically. Um, and that lets you write code in sort of a different, like the state of flow of writing Hoon feels to me significantly different than when I'm writing many other languages. Um, and I think that's actually super valuable. And a lot of people, I mean, I don't, I don't blame people for thinking that because I don't know how I could have even been convinced of that if I hadn't have just thought, oh, this is so cool that I just want to try it and then realized, oh, actually, there's some really serious advantages to this. Um, it's not something that we even hardly have a language to, to argue in favor of. Um, because it's not one of the dimensions that people usually evaluate programming languages on. Which is this, the experience that the state of flow you're describing is kind of qualitative, qualitatively superior. That's what you mean? Um, yeah, like it, it isn't that Hoon is more expressive or has a stronger type system than any other language. N none of those are true. Um, but it is sort of more, more mechanical, uh, and more tangible than almost any other language with the exception of maybe C. Um, but it is then significantly safer and, uh, more powerful than C. And so, um, that's a combination that, that I don't see anywhere else. And that I think is, is exactly what you need in particular to write a kernel, uh, you know, the way that we do for Urbit, um, but also to write apps on top of it. If you want to write in this context where stuff doesn't just disappear, where anything you do gets saved. Um, right, because in in Urbit, all your app memory is persistent. You can pull the plug at any time. You don't lose anything. Um, you're almost writing sort of inside of a database. You know, I, I like to say that Hoon's closest competitor is SQL, not uh, you know not Haskell or Lisp or Python. Um, and so I think there's a lot of value to that. And it it is true that it is one of the more difficult languages to learn. Um, you know, coming from from a background of say Python, um, there are other languages that are probably similarly difficult. I think Haskell is, is going to be at least as difficult for for most people. Some people really pick up Hoon fast, um, and one of my best you know pieces of evidence that it's uh, that it's basically not that complicated and that. Um, basically that, that it's a good language is that we do continually onboard people into Hoon. They, they, they learn how it works. And then they, uh, not, not in every case, but in many cases, they're like, okay, this is my favorite programming language for, for myself. It is my favorite language to just to, subjectively to write programs in. Um, and you know, that, that, that's true of, of some other languages as well. Hoon is not unique in that respect, but it does mean that it's not, um, like who wasn't actually written to, you know, to be difficult to learn, contrary to what a lot of people think. Uh, it was written to be good for writing system software in um, and not very much care was taken to make it easy to learn or to be sort of viral and, you know, getting a bunch of programmers to uh, to want to use it. Because right. the idea is if if Urbit is massively successful, then. It, it, we don't need like the programming language doesn't have to be the selling point, right? It can just be something that people will learn. People will learn based on what platform, uh, you know, you can use with that program. Okay. So it sounds like it goes back to this precept about correctness at all costs, basically. Yeah. It's like the goal is to make there are no undefinable things, no weirdness. It's you, you want to, you want to be doing exactly what you want to be doing and to know exactly what you're doing. And you just pay the price of it's a bit obscure. It's a bit hard to learn, but right. you just bite that bullet, basically. Yeah. And when people say that it it feels unnecessarily complex or almost offensively so, they sometimes cite weird little wrinkles. Like, for instance, people are always talking to me about the uh, how how zero and one are switched. Is there are there are there is there any evidence or anything to the claim that there's there's 
some kind of like artistic excess um, or or trolling. Is there any trolling in the design? Um, I mean, there are some parts of it that may that that are arguably trolling, and <laughs> and, and that one's one of them. Um, there there are not very many of, that are that are quite as you know almost blatant as that. Um, and and Curtis did write at some point that. You know, he he probably if he would do it all again, he probably would would switch them back. But I mean, among other Hoon programmers, first of all, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal to most of us. Um, and I don't know, I can make reasonable arguments in in both directions. I've I've, I've seen really really detailed arguments in both directions, and uh, I don't know, it's a it's a mapping of you know, of two things to two things and, you know, basically true and false to, to one and zero. And you could do those in two right, different like, ways. Who cares? who cares? Right. Yeah. Like the, I, the, the opposite direction, the, the way that it's normally done in other languages ha, has a natural interpretation right. in like the Lambda calculus, but we're not connected to Lambda calculus in any direct way. Um, and so that doesn't matter much. The, the truth is it, it's hardly even the case. Like it's like, that that idea isn't built into knock it isn't built into it's just the way we pronounce them basically um and for some people it seems very intuitive to say that zero is is true and and one is false so people the other the other way is intuitive uh there was a hacker news uh comment section that went off on this for a long time about this you know where they were saying no just like intuitively this is a bad idea um and then they ended up arguing that it's more intuitive to say that success corresponds to false and failure corresponds to true. They're like, that's intuitive, but true corresponding to zero. That's no, that's nonsense. <laughs> and it's just people argue themselves in circles on right. this. It's, it's, it's what they're used to. Um, and it, it does feel like, well, I, I don't think this was really the, the intention. It, it, it is sort of a good sign that maybe someone's not quite ready for a bit if they think that that's a really big deal. Fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. So basically, you would argue that the uh, the design and what seems obscure about it is overwhelmingly justified by the benefits of it and, and the correctness of it. And yeah, maybe there, maybe there's a little bit of, of trolling, but it's really just not that big a deal is, is your response, it sounds like. And maybe are there any specific details that make it uh, a superior language, like the benefits or the payoffs that you're alluding to, maybe for engineers listening to this, um, is there anything you want to drill down into and kind of uh, discuss or share about once you learn it, what makes it actually superior or better in, in certain ways? Maybe, maybe people will be interested to hear more about that. Yeah, I mean, one one of the, the qualities that really jumps out at you um, and that you start to miss in other languages is uh, the way that everything is a noun um, and every, and it's what we call subject oriented, meaning that everything that you can refer to is in a specific noun that you can see that you can manipulate um, instead of being like, okay, I'm defining in my environment, this name corresponds to this function, this name corresponds to this variable, I'm importing these other names in this other file. Um, and there's this sort of abstract environment that you sort of imagine involves this mapping and like various bits of data instead of that being something that you have to keep track of and sort of imagine how it might work, you have just, here's a noun, you know, if, if you're looking for a name, you just start at the left side and go until you find it. Um, and that is, it's a very pleasing way to work to just be like, yeah, everything's right here. Right. And I guess the idea is that be, because the, the design of the system as a whole is so much superior that, all the other benefits also have to be included, right? So the fact that basically on Urbit, when you're designing apps on Urbit, you're basically abstracting out all the DevOps, like all of that goes away, right? right? So you to really do the cost benefit of analysis about like whether or not you want to start building on who on on Urbit and learning who to do so, you actually have to also um, filter in or factor in all of the headaches that you're saving yourself once you learn who. Right. Yeah. De definitely the like the most obvious developer benefits for writing Hoon is that you get a write for Urbit. Um, you get to use all the tools that exist on Urbit. You get to use the identity system notifications. You get to uh, the networking. 
the even the file system, the the way we do updates, all of that comes for free. Um, you don't have to be running your own servers. All of that, uh, you know, as long as you're so even if you don't care for who in the programming language, you're just not going to have to write as much of it as you would if you're in any other system. Right. Okay. Awesome, dude, Philip. Thank you so much for your time. This was awesome. Really yeah. enjoyed it. I think people are going to get get a lot out of this one. And um, yeah, I've, I've cut into the happy hour, so that's very rude of me. But I appreciate your patience. Yeah. This All was right. Good. Thanks, Philip.